Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. It's my intention, as I warned you a few weeks ago, to preach a series of sermons, perhaps four, six, I'm not quite certain how many there will be, about what the Bible says about human sexuality and sexual relationships. There will be sermons where I will tell parents of children and we'll have this planned out beforehand, time to take them out. There are, there are things that we have to discuss nowadays, uh, honestly, because of what we're faced with in the world. Today is not one of those sermons that you'll need to take your children out. They need to hear some of these things. Uh, but I had thought about preaching one entire sermon just surrounding all of the lies that are out there. And there's a lot of lies regarding sexuality that are out there. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to answer as many of those lies, perhaps implicitly or explicitly, within the text as I go. Some may argue that I should begin by preaching on biblical sexuality with an argument for the authority of Scripture. Why do we look at the Scriptures? Why are they where we find the answer for this? But because I'm preaching to the church, I'm going to assume, especially this church that I know, that you do believe that the authority is the final word for all matters of faith and practice. So we come to the word of God and what it says clearly and what it says truly we should obey. Of course, I do believe that other disciplines have something to say on this matter, but I do not think that any of those disciplines usurp the authority of Scripture or can be a a substitute for them. One of the ways that we can look to a thing to see its virtue or uh, its place in uh, our regular lives is to see the fruit of those things. Jesus says wisdom is known by her fruit, and we hear a lot of wisdom that says what's wrong with sexual practice of this sort and that sort if it doesn't produce any evil in society. And so some of those questions are answered because we do see evil increasing in our society. We do see the negative effects of them, but we don't always see them immediately. And I'll talk about that as one of the lies that we are expected to believe. It does no harm that myself and a consenting individual be they who it will, and the privacy of our own lives partake in this sexual activity. It does no harm to you. I would disagree with that, but we don't always see the fruit of that harm immediately. So we don't just argue by the function of fruit of evil or the consequences of it in front of us, because it's not always evident what those consequences are, especially when we have a clear answer from Scripture, as we do very plainly this morning. So what are some lies and misdirections that we will consider this this day? That's how my son says today. This day. Who do, <clears throat> here's one, who I have sex with doesn't matter. And I'm, please forgive me, I am not trying to use these terms at all exploitatively. I know there are some pastors that, that use these phrases sort of exploitatively. I'm not, but I do want to speak honestly to the issue. And this is what we hear. So I'm going to be honest about it. Sex is not really important anyway, some will argue. Why do you care so much about who I have sex with? Why don't you mind your own business? Why is my sex life so important to you? Why can't you just let me live my life the way I want to live it? 
Why do you care who I sleep with in my private life? Why are you so obsessed? Sometimes it's the argument or the misdirection of obsession. What are you obsessing so much about my sex life? And even some Christians today, I don't know if you've heard it, but they will say something like, well, we have to admit that scriptures merely whisper with regards to sexual matters. That's not the main point of the scriptures, some Christians will say. And so then they say, well, the scriptures merely whisper about it. And by that, why make such a big deal about sexual righteousness? Some of those questions can be held sincerely. Some of them are merely duplicitous. Some of them are merely to get us to put our guard down. Paul says that we are in warfare. Now, you can take warfare and you can use it as an illustration within combat sports. I like boxing. And one of the things that you're told when you come and you're facing your opponent, I never boxed, but as I'm familiar with it and I've seen it, they say, keep your guard up. Some of these lies, some of these misdirections are not to convince us necessarily, but they're to just, just drop your guard a little bit. Just put your guard down a little bit. It's not, not too big of a deal, you know. That person in front of you doesn't really have great art. You just put your, you know, he's not a great fighter. Drop your hands. I think when we come to this text today, we should have our hands very high in matters of sexual righteousness and defending against these lies that we are told. Now, we breathe in these lies. We drink them up. Somebody said, a fish doesn't know it's wet. We don't know sometimes when we are hearing lies because we hear them so often. They're so familiar to us. They become like breathing air. And so that's why we need to come again and again to the scriptures for the truth. The first point really has three reasons why sexual righteousness matters for Christians. And this is found in verses 15 through 20. The context here of the church at Corinth is that they were overlooking a, an egregious sexual sin. Even a sexual sin that the pagan world around them would deem shameful. In chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, It is actually reported, there's some astonishment here, that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even amongst pagans. For a man has his father's wife. There's an incestuous relationship going on. We don't need to argue about the basis, the, the, uh, the, the elements re, re, are surrounding this relationship. Some say, well, it's a, it was a widow. It doesn't matter. This is forbidden in Scripture. It's obviously sinful. I'm not going to argue the basis of the sinfulness of this act. Even in our sexually erotic culture, we would still find this abrasive and evil. And this was happening in the church of Corinth. In fact, Corinth was such a sexually uh, promiscuous place that there were, there were terms that you were being a Corinthian when you were acting s certain ways sexually certain perverted sexual acts. You were being like a Corinthian. But even this wasn't tolerated among them. And the attitude of the Corinthian church in verse 2 was that they were arrogant about this. You ought not rather to mourn. Ought you not rather to mourn that you're letting this happen? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. They were, they were arrogant in allowing this to take place, and they were boasting that it's allowed. Well, the reason why I point that boast out is because when we come to chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, we read, which in the ESV has some quotations to it. There seems to be a back and forth between some proverbs that this church is holding to and what the apostle is teaching, what he is, by the authority of the apostolic uh, uh, calling, is actually teaching the church. First of all, they say, all things are lawful for me. Now, Paul repeats that again in chapter 13. It seems like Paul probably taught them that in the sense of Christian freedom, 
but it was also something that the Stoics would teach in regards to libertarian freedom, that there is no constraints at all whatsoever. Paul is not a libertarian. Libertarian freedom is not Christian freedom. I'm not going to try to go into the difference there, but I hope that you can follow me. While we are free, we are not free to do anything. And that's what Paul will very clearly point out. All things are lawful for me. And now Paul's answer is, but not all things are helpful. Not all things regard love. All things are lawful for me. Paul's answer, but I will not be dominated by anything. And so when we come to verse 13, we can be tempted to think that Paul is saying, all things are lawful for me again, and then answering them with the second answer. But realize this, that quotations are not in the original. Interpreters are putting those quotations there to try to decipher how Paul is framing his argument. But remember what we just read, that this church was boasting about their sexual sins. Like it's okay. Now we read verse 13. Food is meant for the stomach. Here's the maxim. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. But here's what I believe. I believe the proverb continues. And this is, in a sense, their statement, their argument for why they can continue in this sexual sin or wink at it. And God will destroy both one and the other. In other words, what they're saying is, what does it matter what we do in the body? Eat, drink, it's going to be destroyed anyway. If I have sex with my relative, what does it matter? The body's just going to be destroyed anyway. They were using this maxim and saying, well, it's meant for the grave. We're just going to eat and drink and all that's going to waste anyway. And they were saying, in effect, it doesn't matter what we do with our body. Was their argument. Now, this is exactly where Paul picks up in his Holy Spirit inspired correction of the church and he begins in verse 15 with a question do you not know that your bodies are members of christ now he also talks about this in chapter 12 but here he illustrates very clearly that it is not just spiritually that we are united to christ but our bodies this flesh and This bone, some of us, if we have muscle, some of us, if we have fat, whatever, it all belongs to Christ as part of his body. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8, to go back a little bit within the context here, because this is important. In relationship to their sexual sin, he says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. Unleavened means that you are free from sin here in Christ. In Christ, we are known to God as being justified, cleansed from sin. That's who we really are before God. We have been delivered from the condemnation of our sin by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how we're known. But this is illustrated in A festival, Paul says, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil. In the context, it would also mean sexual evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's speaking here, I believe, about the Lord's table. You come to the Lord's table, you're partaking of the Lord Jesus Christ in remembrance of what he has done for you by faith in that once and for all death, you are partaking of him. You should have no part in sin, he's saying. Then again, again, regarding the Lord's table, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, again, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a partition, participation in the body of Christ? So Paul says of this church that many were ill and many had died 
because they came to the table of the war, Lord unworthily. And thus were guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, eating and drinking, the apostle says, judgment on themselves. Now, in the context of all of this, we can assume that one of the sins that they were approaching the table of, the Lord, the Lord's Supper, partaking of that and living openly, malice, hostility, sin. We already saw in the early part of this letter that they had factions within the church. They were divided and they were taking communion, which united them. There were so many faults with this church. Among them was sexual sin. As believers in Christ who participate with him in his once for all time death, our bodies are in covenantal vital union with Christ. Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are members with Christ? We see how this works out with relationship to sexual sin. First, sexual sin adulterates our union with Christ. That's the word I'm choosing to use, and I know it's a strong word, and it's going to conjure up all sorts of ideas in your head, like, can we lose our salvation? And I hope that you'll hang with me, because I don't believe we can, but I want you to hear the strength of this argument. So don't put in your mind, well, I'm once saved, always saved. If I want to live in sexual sin, I'm perfectly happy here, because I know God will accept me. Beware if you have that mentality. Because what Paul says, he doesn't put any qualifications on it. Shall I then take the member of Christ, the members of Christ, your body, if you're a Christian? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them a member of a prostitute, porne, somebody who made their living through the selling of their body for sexual activity. And Paul's answer, Meginomai, never, never. The old translation used to say, God forbid, it's a strong negative. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, Now, sexual righteousness has everything to do with creation. Everything to do with creation. If you jettison creation from your theology, and you think evolution can take its place, theistic evolution, God just made everything void, and then evolution took its course, no historical Adam, none of that. If you jettison all that, eventually you will lose any sort of biblical authority for sexual ethics, for sexual righteousness. You you can't maintain it. You will lose it. Because Paul bases it on creation. Jesus Jesus bases it on creation. Jesus quotes this very text, and we'll see that later in the teachings. Creation and redemption have everything to do with righteous sexual desires and expression. Verse 17 but he who is joined to the Lord bodily becomes one spirit with him. Now this should leave us speechless, and this is where I was corrected, and I was corrected because I don't think, even though I had my guard up a bit, I don't think I had my guard up this high. But listen to the privilege first. Listen to the privilege Our bodies are members of Christ. He is the Lord of all. He's the creator of everything. He is the most beautiful person in existence. And our bodies are joined to his. What kind of of redeemer do we have that, do you know your sin? Do you know your own failings? Do you think you deserve to be there? Christ has made you his beloved. 
He has made you in his own blood, in his own sacrifice, we'll see that later, worthy of being joined to him. This is great privilege to be joined with him. Being joined to him means that we have an eternal inheritance that is rightfully his. Eternal life, eternal joys. We say, joyful, joyful, we adore him. God has ordained that our joy be whole and that it just increase forever because we are joined in union with Christ. The privileges of this cannot be overstated. Our union with Christ. And that by grace. But it should leave us speechless that being joined body and soul to Christ, how indifferent then we can be with regards to sexual righteousness because of what Paul says here. Paul is saying that sexual sin is expressly opposed to our vital union with Christ, our true, real union, be it mystical, and in fact is spiritual adultery. Jesus said that in marriage, two become one. He affirmed Genesis 2.24. And this is also a designation that God had joined them together. And, and Jesus says, what God has joined together, let not men separate. Listen to this. In light of those truths, God has joined us together with Christ. And when we enjoin ourselves with somebody who is not our spouse sexually, we are saying to God, no, I won't be joined to Christ. I'm going to be joined to this person. I, that's why I said, I don't think my guard is high enough. That's what Paul is saying. He, he's using marriage terms. We're in a marriage covenant with Christ. We're the bride. He's using those terms to describe our bodily, the importance of bodily righteousness in regards to sexuality. Sexual sin is an, an act, I think Paul is saying, he's implying it's an act of spiritual adultery against Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Do you love him? This, how high should our guard be as believers? This is for believers here with regards to sexual righteousness. Will you separate yourself from that union for the sake of a momentary pleasure? A fleeting pleasure? Another aspect of being married to Christ, and Paul speaks about it, we'll look at it, is that Jesus has rights over our body. Verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. There's two aspects of our union with Christ mentioned here. First, our bodies are members of Christ's body. And second, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. What a gift. You see, God doesn't speak about this issue with regards to, oh, look at all the things he's keeping from us. That's one of the lies undergirding all of the lies of sexual promiscuity. It's just the same as Satan in the garden. Look what God is keeping you from, this tree. Do you see the blessing that God has poured out upon his people? That we are joined in union to God the Son. And the Spirit lives in us. He dwells in us. God has given us the garden full of every good thing. And he's told us no to the thing that would separate us from him. And are we going to listen to the lies? It's no big deal. What do you care? It's just 
it's nothing serious. It's serious. It's absolutely vital. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 speaks explicitly regarding that price. Knowing that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like the lamb without blemish or spot. We want to sing songs to Jesus. The billions of creatures praise you. I will too. We want to sing songs in the morning of worship, Sunday morning. And if you act like sexual righteousness is nothing important at all, you betray all of those things. You betray your confession. You betray that you even care about what he did for you on Calvary, in a sense. Because I have to commit this act. I'm so driven by this allurement, this temptation, that that confession is going to be put on hold. That blood that was precious and poured out for me is less important than this relationship. That's the framework that Paul is speaking of here. That's the framework. Second, sexual sin obscures the glory of God. He says, so glorify your God in your body. In other words, implied in that is that when we live sexually in sin, we don't glorify God. We obscure the glory of God. God is not glorified when we live sexually impure. Nothing short of God's glory is at stake in the matter of sexual righteousness. The glory of God encompasses everything that Paul has said about our relationship, body and soul to Christ, our being in union with Him in His body, the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. What does the world know about us when we live in ways that obscure the glory of God? They don't know that we're not our own. They don't know the glory of Christ in us. They don't see any difference. What we have been saved for with regards to the glory of God is to display His glory rightly and to enjoy His glory forever. And both of those things are obscured when we live in sexual sin. When we enjoin ourselves to someone in sexual sin, we effectively put our bodies back under the authority of adulterous sin and not unto Christ. 1 Corinthians 7, 4 says, For the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is how close the union of man and woman, husband and wife, is in the marriage relationship. And this doesn't glorify God when we put our bodies under the subjection of sin. Third, sexual sin opposes ourselves, our own bodies. Flee from sexual immorality. That's an urgency. Flee from it. The picture in my mind is to Joseph, isn't it? Potiphar? I mean, you, Joseph's a young man. Here's a probably a beautiful woman. I don't think the powerful men in those days probably chose women that they didn't find attractive. This is probably a beautiful woman trying to seduce him. And what does he do? He runs from her. One of the lies we're told today is that you, if somebody finds you attractive, you should just give yourself to them. It's actually offensive if you don't find them attractive too. Even with transgender people, that's especially where that's argued for. Run, flee from it. Listen to why he says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Now this is difficult to understand. There, I read one guy, he said there's about 50 ways that people have argued why what does Paul mean here 
Every other sin is a sin outside the body. And there are people, well, suicide is a sin against the, your own body, gluttony, drunkenness. But I don't think, I think what Paul has in mind, maybe we could simplify and say it, you don't need any outside influence for this sin. All you need is your, your own body and a body of somebody else. It, there's, there's something pervasive about it. There's something, as I talked with a brother this week, there's something idolatrous about it. The body itself becomes a substitute for Christ. My pleasure, my satisfaction can be found in myself through this act. And I think that gets to the point, to the depths of what Paul is saying. You use your body to find satisfaction where you should find satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in sin. Does sexual righteousness matter, believer? It matters deeply. Does God whisper about it? It's essentially, it maybe essentially, it is essentially related to your union with Christ. Does it matter? It's related to the spirit who dwells in you. Does it matter? It's related to the proper use, the God created use of your own body to worship him and not yourself. It absolutely matters. Sexual sin adulterates our bodily union with Christ, grieves the indwelling Holy Spirit, and veils the glory of God, and mars the purpose of our creation to glorify our God, our God with body and soul. Let me say a word to you. I do not believe the apostle is teaching this in order to convey that Christians lose their place in the covenant when we commit this sin. Chapter 5, this man is living with, he's living in a sinful relationship with his mother. Sexual relationship. Paul does not say that person has lost his salvation. He says, put that person out of the church so that Satan can buffet him so that he would be restored in repentance. Repentance is key. Now, if somebody will say to me, I'm a Christian, I'm living in this sexual sin, and that's just fine with me and it's fine with God, I would warn them to flee from the wrath that's to come. Your confession of faith in Christ does not agree with the conduct of the fruit of that possession of the Holy Spirit in you and Christ's possession of you. But I would say to you, if you are struggling with sexual sin this morning, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness if you will turn from it. Cling to Christ. Trust in Christ. Believe in Christ. And we see that in following in the, sex, the second argument, the second main point, why sexual righteousness matters for the unbeliever. This is not as long as the first point, but I've answered it, I pray, for the first point for us, why it matters for us as Christians. I think it's clear. Why does it matter for unbelievers? Go back to chapter 6, verse 9. <laughs> Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, and then he goes through other lists of sins, and then he repeats it, will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not going to exposit the dis different sins on this list of vices. I only wish to point out that the vices in verse 9 are all connected in Scripture to sexual sin. All of them, even idolatry. Romans 1, 18-25 is inseparately connected with the sin of homosexuality and other immoral sexual activities. And the beginning of it 
is the act of idolatry, that people uh, exchange the glory of God for the image of the created thing. They worship the creature, not the creator. And this leads to all sorts of sins. The first on the list, which is homosexual acts, which is an act that is inconvenient in the old translation. It's one that is a sin against the body itself. But Paul also lists several vices in Colossians 3, 5, and he summarizes them, many of them, if not all of them in Colossians 3, 5, are summarized with the word idolatry. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. And I think Paul uses this word to describe the function of all of them, idolatry. And so when he includes in verse 9, neither sexually immorality, immoral, idolaters, adulterers, or men who practice homosexuality, we can see all of those four things within what scripture says about sexual sins. I just, we just saw that Paul argues that sexual sin in the body is as if you were sort of self-worshipping yourself, using your body for a restricted pleasure that God has reserved for your spouse. And what does he say about these who live this way? Unrepentedly, unbelieving the gospel, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sexual righteousness matters because the scriptures are clear that those who live in sexual sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not be saved. They will not have their sins forgiven. They will not inherit eternal life. They will have no place with the coming kingdom that will last forever. Positively, though, the scriptures put it another way. Revelation 21, verse 8, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death which Jesus says does not end. Why do we care who the world has sex with? They're not believers. They're not in union to Christ. Why do we care about that question for them? And one of the answers is that because we care for their souls. If your mind said, because we want our nation back. That is a byproduct of the gospel. Yes, we want a righteous nation, but if you do not care for the souls of these people, you will never minister to them. Your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, you will never minister the, to them in love. The reason why sexual righteousness matters is because people who live in that unrepentantly will have eternal hell, justly. And I tremble saying that. I'm not pronouncing that. That's the word of God pronouncing it. That's God in his righteous wrath upon all ungodliness who has provided out of love, a solution for that unrighteousness in giving his son. So that what Paul says as he goes on in verse 11 about these in the church, you see that list, that list of vices he just read, that we just read? Sexual, immoral, idolaters, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexual, verse 10, liars, swindlers, revilers, on and on. They won't have a place in the kingdom of God. And then he says this, but such were some of you. And I would say we're not necessarily all of those things, but in this room, I guarantee you we're checking off those lists. I was sexually immoral when God, when God saved me. 
I belong to this list of redeemed people. And if it wasn't for my redemption in Christ Jesus, I would have no hope. And I would be without God in the world. But that is not the end of the story, is it? We care about this issue because we can't, we are we not taught to love the way God loves? He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. In the very least, we should be praying for those we know in sexual sin and are unrepentant of it and unbelieving. We should be calling them to repentance. We should care enough to warn them of the wrath that is to come. If you believe the word of God, you will care about these things. You will care enough to love your unbelieving neighbor enough to tell them the truth in love. You will not encourage them in their sin as we are called to do. You will not display a rainbow flag on your Facebook account and say love is love. Because if they remain in that sin, the wrath of God remains on them. The Apostle Paul says something in, Reb in Romans chapter 1. At the end in verse 25. He says, not only are people guilty who take part in those sins. But also those are guilty who affirm them. You affirm sin that God calls sin. You are not loving people and you are guilty as an accomplice to their sin be warned about what the word of God says believe the word of God if you believe God you will not substitute your own comfort your own convenience your own status your own place in your workplace. Your own reputation as somebody who accepts sin, celebrates and supports it. You will not exchange that for love. Now what I mean by love is not harassing them every day. Did you repent yet? Did you repent yet? Did you repent yet? Did you you dirty sinner. What I mean by love is an honest love that truly prays for them, that loves them enough to, to have sincere conversations over a meal. When Christ sat down with publicans and sinners, he did not take part in their, their sin, but he loved them enough to call them to him. I'm not asking you to go out from among them. Paul says that's not what we're called to do in the sense of leaving the world behind. We're called to go to them, even if they hate us for it. If they hate you for it, know that they hated Jesus first and know that you're on the right track. Should we care? Yes, we should care. Yes, we should have our convictions established by the word of God with regards to sexual righteousness. And I pray that over the coming weeks, we'll have a clear picture of what our convictions should be in accordance with the scripture and all for the glory of God. Let's pray. Our Father.